You're listening to the Cynic Radio Podcast. Now, your hosts, Igri and Cynic. Hey, and welcome to the Cynic Radio Podcast. I'm Ig, that cynic. With us this week is Cage. We're going to be talking about episode four of The Walking Dead service. Looking forward to hearing everything we got going on. Get a little bit into our heads. Here we go. All right. This week, we're going to start uh, The Walking Dead, the episode entitled Service. So we uh, we start the episode back in Alexandria. Rick Schoen, by the way, I hate when they pair couples' names like that. Rick Schoen's in bed together, and it, it looks like there's still a thing, but barely. A noticeable distance between the two of them as she glares at his back. Now, I personally have gotten that uh, that look before, and I know Rick's awake because you can feel that burning directly into your soul. What do you think the overhead shot, uh, Egg, of them together, yet the distance, what do you think that signifies? I think it signifies that they're still looking at what happened uh, out with their meeting with Negan. I think that that it's still striking, and it still, still has them all guessing what's going to be next. Where are we going from here? What are we doing? Uh, how can we survive? I mean, what are they going to want from us? I mean, Cage, don't you see it the same way? I do. I uh, Seeing that scene, it just showed how deeply they were affected by the situation, by Negan, by his presence, by, you know, the whole theatrical show he put on in front of everybody to claim his place as the leader of not only his group, but now of theirs. I feel like Michonne isn't used to giving away control like that, especially having somebody as strong as Rick, you know, kind of bow down to somebody like Negan. So I think that's what that was representing, was representing the fact that she watched one of her strongest players in her group have to basically go fetal to guarantee their survival. Yeah, I think so, too. And and Cynic, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, I mean, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And, you know, the only one that's more scorned than Michonne right now, I think, would be Maggie. And Maggie had to go get some medical help. I mean, what, what do you think about this? Well, I can't recall whether Michonne was at the prison when Lori died and Rick absolutely lost it. I don't think she was. So I don't think she's ever actually seen him in this state before. So I think uh, there's a combination of maybe disbelief and surprise. The guy is a pillar of strength in every situation. So uh, at the end of the day, you know, she's having to process what's happened to her friends and what's also happened to their leader. So we move on to another, uh, what to me, uh, I love these little nuanced shots that they do sometimes in shows. We move on to her walking towards the fireplace and there's two empty nails hanging on the wall, which to me signifies when they got to Alexandria and she finally hung up the sword, she thought things were going to be different. Did you guys notice that? So yeah, I did notice that. I did notice the fact that um, she was, Alexandria was supposed to be the, the, Sanctuary that was supposed to be the ultimate home of, you know, we left the world that the world is now behind us. We don't, you know, we don't have to worry about it anymore. And that was her safe haven. And now seeing that, you know, they are in the situation they're in now, she's like, nothing's really changed. I'm still in the same world, regardless of how high the walls are, regardless of, you know, where you go, you're still in the same world that the world has turned into. And the world is definitely a deadly place here, you know, and. It also says to me that she's not afraid to pick back up the sword and stand for what she believes in. Yeah, I'm in agreement there. She gets the the rifle from the fireplace and leaves. On her way out the door, we uh, happen to notice an interesting poster hanging on the wall, but we'll get to that later. Uh, Rick kind of pops up behind her without her seeing, you know, much like Carol, always watching, always waiting. And he goes on to pick up baby Judith, who looks like she's aged about two years in the last three episodes. Well, you know, it's hard to keep babies in this stuff because they are going to age and they've got downtime between filming and babies tend to age very quickly and you want them to kind of be the same baby. But you're also showing passage of time um, just because it's it's one episode to the next for us doesn't mean it's not weeks, months and longer at times. 
between all these things actually happening. They're not giving us a, an accurate time frame of what this happening, just that they're in the apocalypse and it's happening. Well, I think uh, Talking Dead gave a, a three-day window into the episode from the post-Negan experience. <laughs> uh, the reason why they don't show Judith is probably because she's not a main character. I mean, you know, she is important as far as showing the whole family aspect between Carl and Rick and Michonne and showing that, you know, as devastating as the world is nowadays, it, they still try to have some form of normality. But um, that's as... Ig said they're going to grow, they're going to, you know, grow up and evolve and become the people they become. Yeah, once again, we're seeing a shot that is going to play into something in the episode later. I also heard a collective awe from the female audience when he picked the baby up. So we're going to go ahead and, and we're going to cut to outside where Emo Eugene is uh, working on some sort of electrical contraption. I guess he's the the anchor man no longer because he kind of looks befuddled about the events that have taken place. Uh, Rosita and Spencer come to the gate. It looks like they're going out to scavenge. Uh, Eugene is having none of that. He's uh, He wants to sit there and play with whatever he's working on. So as they're getting ready to open the gate and leave, a silhouette appears at the door knocking. It looks like a, a large bat-like ob- uh, a large bat-like object hitting against the fence, and then we start. Little pigs, little pigs, let me in. And always quick on his feet, Spencer replies, "Who are you?" As if he didn't hear before. Negan almost shocked looks and says, "You have to be joking, right?" Yeah, I can't imagine how anybody wouldn't have an idea who Negan is after everything happened. I mean, they'd have had to go back and warn everybody that this was going to happen. I mean, just there's no way the rest of Alexandria didn't know that he was going to show up and want half of everything. So, I mean, they got an I mean, what other crazy motherfucker is going to show up to the door and and little pig, little pig, let me in. I mean, <laughs> Uh, quick on the draw, uh, he is not. So, I mean, it, it was a, a fun way to, to introduce him into the Alexandria area. But, you know, sometimes I think some of these outlying characters leave a little to be desired. I feel like it was more like lackluster writing because, as you said, where do you go? <laughs> so they just came back from being completely taken over from their original mission, which was where they killed all of Negan's people. They come back and you don't know anything that went on. You don't know anything that took place. You notice Abraham didn't come back. You notice Glenn didn't come back. You notice Maggie didn't come back. Nobody that didn't raise questions in anybody's mind that didn't say, nope, we're going to come back and be silent and depressed and heartbroken and probably damaged beyond a relief because, oh man, I can't understand, you know, what just happened. And nobody else in the community that now is going to give half their resources to is going to find out what's going on. I don't believe that. But Spencer didn't only show in this episode, but in past episodes that he has something that's not really desired. I love the shot. I, 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 I love the whole shot of him banging on the gate. And, uh, you know, I, I, I even like the line, uh, the way it was delivered. Uh, an introduction to a character in the scene is one thing that Negan can definitely do right. I mean, I had some issues with the cell last week uh, with the the overuse of the character, but I mean, the the beginning of this was definitely on point. So, uh, you know, he introduces himself to the always uh, on point Spencer and says, you know, Negan, Lucille, I know we made a strong first impression. Rick rushes the gate and informs Negan he's a, a week early. As the gate opens, a wa- one walker appears. And, you know, uh, I had a little bit of a problem with that. Uh, Negan goes over and dispatches him and delivers the worst line of the show. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Just terrible, terrible, lazy writing there. I believe that it was, yeah, just as I said, it was, it's easy little catchphrases. It's easy little, you know, fun sayings that make this monster into something more i guess pliable somebody you can deal with more somebody that's you know seems a bit more human even though he's psychotic i don't know what the writing is for what their idea was for this particular episode but i do believe that it did lack any real creativity because you don't go and build negan up to be such a strong character the way you did when he 
killed Glenn the way you did when he killed Abraham, the psychological warfare he did on Daryl to now this happy go lucky, you know, rhyming leader that isn't really the character he truly is. I disagree. I, I think the campiness that he that he lends into it, I think that's what makes Negan Negan. You know, if, if you, we think back to our first introductions with him and, and how he dealt with the group, I mean, he uses all kinds of campy little things, you know, doing the eeny, meeny, miny, mo and calling it a vampire bat and easy peasy, lemon squeezy. That's Negan. It is Negan. And the thing is, is that he's so aloof about the absolute brutal and barbaric things that he does. I think that's a big thing that strikes quite a bit of fear into people because it's like he simply doesn't care. He'll do as he pleases, when he pleases, and how he feels like it. And nothing you say or do is going to stop him from doing that. So I think it was the right choice there. I, I liked it. I, I thought it worked well. So we see that the Saviors have come out in force, and in my opinion, that's the only thing that they have. Uh, they have large numbers. I believe their their fighting skill pales in comparison to everyone except the Hilltop at this point. And uh, we get a very dirty looking Daryl, as, as he was last episode, in a in a snuggie with his brother, not Daryl, standing next to him. So, first time through, I, uh, did you guys pick up on the Morse code? I did not. I I. I... I guess I vaguely remember seeing the poster, but I didn't. I didn't figure out that Daryl was trying to process things back to him. I completely, it completely went over my head when I watched the episode myself. I didn't sit there and get it at all. I didn't understand what the blinking was about. I just thought that it was trying to show that Daryl was extremely affected by the situation. I didn't pick up on the fact at all that he was trying to convey a message across to Rick. I would assume it's been broken down by now, has it not? Hasn't someone figured out what he was blinking? Yeah, I believe it's six uh, six miles east of Hilltop was what he was saying to him. Well, that's good. Inf- that's good intel, anyway. Yeah, it definitely kind of makes sense that they're they're all within relative driving distance. You know, I I believe Hilltop they said was like an hour to two hours away, depending on what route they had to take. So, uh, you know, um, somebody uh, I spoke with during the week was a little bit disheartened with the fact that all these groups are out there and they're in large numbers in these different communities, yet nobody's run into each other till now. You know, I, I, I think it's a suspension of dis, uh, disbelief, definitely. The thing that I found really interesting is the fact that he was able to blink Morse code six miles to the east of Hilltop. You've got to be real good at Morse code to sit there and convey that message and not only receive it and know that that's what he's saying. Well, but on the flip side, you know, even though he's on easy street and it feels so neat, he's got nothing but time. He can he can figure it out and he can he can practice and he can work on it because he's got the time to perfect it. It's one of those things where they always write Daryl like they did Ray in the last Star Wars movie where he's just naturally apt at everything. I mean, if you gave him a sewing machine, I'm pretty sure he could make you a dress. You know, it, it, it's one of those things where Daryl could do He took a tank out with a single grenade. So, you know, once again, suspension of disbelief. But, uh, you know, I, I, I like the the little jump there, you, you know, the, the, the sharing of information. It happens slightly different in the comic book because there's no Daryl. But uh, we move forward and Negan comes back and uh, he, he has a little bit of a, you know, uh, a little bit of go at Rick. He said, did you see that, Rick? Now, that was service. I always love when they work the name of the episode into the dialogue. And uh, he said, we almost tur- got turned away at the gate. Did I get mad? Did I throw a fit? Did I bash a ginger's head in? Now, I want to make note to that. Uh, obviously, Abraham didn't die that way in the comic books. So it was, did I bash an Asian boy's uh, uh, head in? So... I'm not sure if the change was made to include Abraham or it was just kind of a PC police type thing. What did you guys feel about that? I'm more of a line of just including Abraham because I think the Glenn loss is still stinging pretty bad in the community. And and to keep bringing that up, especially when we haven't really seen Maggie in the last two episodes or yeah, last two episodes. So I I think you have to, stay on the Abraham train for that one because his loss, while significant, wasn't as painful as Glenn's loss. 
they do have a way of killing the collective uh, conscience of the group off. So I think Morgan may want to watch his back there. So the, uh, Negan pulls the most demeaning, uh, demeaning move of the episode as he hands Rick Lucille to carry around with him. If you're going to show your power, you're going to have to sit there and do some pretty extreme things. I do believe that if uh, if you want to assert your dominance all the way across, you've got to play that I'm the master role. And Rick is really just a broken dog at this point. Well, we go right into more uh, metal warfare as Negan says to Rick. He looks around Alexander. He's like, wow, would you look at this place? This you have an embarrassment of riches here, so he's already talking up how he's not only you. You're lucky to have this. Or you're lucky you're allowing me to have this, Rick. But you know, there's so much that you can give me. So uh, Rick turns and tries to talk to Daryl and his uh, snuggy clad self, and uh, Negan tells him that he better stop and don't make me cut you. Don't make me make you cut pieces off of him. Uh, he kind of says the same goes for everybody, and he eyeballs Rosita. I don't know if you guys picked up on this or not, but there wasn't an ounce of backup in Rosita at all there. No, she's she's in kind of go mode. Rosita is a very strong character. She's really tough. And I don't think that, you know, she's ready to back down from Negan, even if that means that some people are going to have to die. And I don't know if she understands the consequences. It could go a lot of different ways. I am excited about that. I'm excited to see what directions it could go. I'm a little concerned because I feel like not saying that, you know, that she's overreacting. I'm not saying that she's overly emotional, but obviously the loss of Abraham was a big loss for her. And I feel like she's just going off of the adrenaline right now. It's kind of the same with Sasha and Tyrese. Once she lost him, it was kind of hard to get herself back. And I feel like this is Rosita getting herself back, you know, Going about things the way she's going about things, approaching situations with no fear. I, you know, you can't tell if that's her clearly and calmly assessing the situation and not being worried about what's going to happen next, or if she's just allowing her emotions to overtake her uh, analytical mind. Well, based on what we've seen from Michonne, what we know what's going to happen with Maggie, uh, the flex that Rosita just displayed, I think this is going to be the season of the female character. The, uh, and rightfully so. I, I, they dropped the ball completely in season two and season three from the poor writing of Lori to the, the terrible writing for Andrea. Rick informs Negan that they put half their supplies aside for him. Negan, and here comes the problem with this type of arrangement. He says, no, Rick. You don't decide what we take. I decide what we take. That goes back to Negan playing the whole boss role. You know, he's he's the one who decides what's half. He's the one who decides how much he takes because he's playing the leader role. He's, you know, and, you know, it's not even a leader role. He's playing the dictator role because that's what he is. He's he's commanding what he wants. He gets what he wants. And due to the fact that he has the muscle behind him. There's really no question in his game. You got to sit there and take what he gives. And hopefully he allows you to keep the bare minimum that he lets you keep. Because otherwise you have no choice in the matter. You have no say. And he wants Rick to know that every time. I think more than a dictator role, it's more of a conqueror role. I think what it looks like is he's coming in and exerting his will to try and break the people of Alexandria. He's trying to make sure that they have no qualms, no idea that they're going to stand up against him, that, you know, I'll take what I damn well please when I damn well please, and you'll do nothing about it. In fact, you're going to smile while I do it because I'm going to let you keep breathing my air. And it's harsh, it's crass, but it's effective. And, well, it's, it's going to be effective for now. Anyway, I mean, we'll see where it goes. I can't imagine this is going to go unscathed just knowing this show. Something's got to break at some point. Well, this is a reason why you never give in to blackmail or terrorism, because it's not half. It's whatever they decide they want to take from you. So not Daryl walks over to Rosita and Spencer and asks them where they're going. He channels his inner rock. He says, hey, where are you guys headed? And then it uh, screams at him. It doesn't matter where you're headed. So he disarms them, uh, takes their water, and sends them on a little mission to go find real Daryl's bike. Gotta have real Daryl's bike. 
I mean, he's already wearing real Daryl's vest. I think he's got a little bit of real Daryl envy. Yeah, he's definitely got to complete that whole cosplay thing he's got going on. And what better way to do that with Daryl's bike, right? Exactly. I mean, and that's where he's got to go. That it's it's penis envy on the next level. I mean, it, there, there's no other way to show that. Hey, I'm better than you, and I got exactly what I wanted without you doing anything to stop me. I mean, he's he's definitely someone to look at because he does take a lot after Negan, but it's he's more of a small fry due to mentality. He's not going to sit there and challenge. He's he's too scared to sit there and go up against the grain. So I feel like he's, you know, he's in his place for a reason but to sit there and try to be the the negan to daryl as negan is to rick is just crazy and in what has to be the most impressive uh, show of marksmanship since the kennedy assassination uh, we cut to michonne shooting at a walker uh standing on top of an old rusty truck uh, I think they did Michonne's character a huge disservice there. I mean, the, uh, she could have took that scope off, threw it, and hit that poor walker. By the way, I, I counted nine times she shot and missed, but she did accidentally kill a deer in the process, so not all is lost. Man, I, that it is a disservice, because I don't know. I know she's very strong with her sword, and that's been her, her main method of surviving the apocalypse. I get it, but... You're going to need to be able to pick up arms at some point because sometimes you're going to have things that aren't going to be so easy to knock down and aren't quite as slow. So you're going to have to be able to do something. I mean, she couldn't hit the broadside of a fucking barn. She couldn't hit anything. I don't think she'd have hit water if she fell out of a boat at this point. She, she was having such a hard time and it, it just looked almost pitiful. And to accidentally hit a deer, I mean, talk about a needle in a haystack. You know what was the craziest thing about that entire scene to me? How far did she go away that she was able to practice these nine horrible shots and not hit the walker at all and nobody hear her, not the people in Alexandria, not Negan's people, but she was able to sit there and run right back in mid-afternoon when they were getting invaded and nothing happened. I don't understand how she was able to walk anywhere it has to be between five to ten miles away from Alexandria, practice, suck at it, and then come back and, you know, in, in midday and, oh, something's happening? We're, we're getting taken over? I don't know. I don't, that was my biggest quarrel with this episode. Well, as they were, uh, you know, pillaging uh, Alexandria, Negan's definitely happy with the compliance of the people so far. It, uh, quote, unquote, tickles his balls. And out of pure uh, excitement and joy, he... Uh, he wastes a perfectly good soda, which, you know, they're not making any more of those. Um, generic henchman number five brings Negan a camcorder. Uh, it's a tape from Deanna's office of Rick's interview. He asks Rick, is that you there under all that man, Bush? I wouldn't have messed with that guy, but you aren't that guy anymore, are you, Rick? Nope. He sure the hell isn't. But, you know, it's just... It's continuing to poke the bear. Now, this may be a very well-trained bear, a super well-trained German Shepherd, Doberman, whatever you want to call him. But eventually, that bear's going to have enough. But so far, it's working for Negan. I think, though, all these things are going to stick in his craw at some point. It's, it's one of those things where it can't just keep going. You can't poke the bear that many times and not get something coming back. I feel like this is just more than... More, more overzealous Negan. It's, you know, you remember the, the episode with Daryl being tortured constantly. You're in, there's no way you get to sleep with another man's wife and think that you're going to be cool with it. So to sit there and think, oh, I'm going to be able to take all I want from your community and you're going to give it happily and we're going to keep smiling, being friends about it. You have to know at some point they're going to attack. As you said, they can be as well-trained or you can try to train them as well as you want. And they'll sit there, comply, play possum for as long as they need to. But the second they see a moment of weakness, the second they're able to get a vulnerability of yours, they're going to use it. And that's what he's waiting for. He knows that Negan doesn't trust him. He knows that Negan is more than well enough prepared to take on any plans that he 
puts forward. So he's going to sit there and take his time. But to sit there and continually just bash him with the fact that there's nothing he can do, to bash him with the fact that he's not the man he once was, that's going to become a problem for Negan in the future. So we cut the genius shot number two in the episode. Uh, we go from Rick's video to Negan filming Rick you know, and how he looks today. Uh, I absolutely love that shot. I, I you know, once again, I, I love when they do stuff like that. It, um, Negan then brings up, he strokes his beard a little bit and he says, I really need to shave that shit. So, uh, to break down the fourth wall there, comic book Negan was always clean shaven while most of the other saviors had full beards. When, uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan was contracted to this role, he was working on another project and he was, uh, he wasn't able to shave. So hence Negan having a beard, but they keep, uh, kind of throwing that little red herring out there to everybody. I have a feeling when we see him next season, he's going to be uh, fully shaven. So he turns to Rick and suddenly is uh, worried about the well-being of the sick girl that was in the uh, the kneeling line. Yeah, I, I didn't understand that. I didn't understand why all of a sudden it's, oh, where's that girl? I want to see her. I was, I, you know, she, he knew for a fact that Glenn was the one she cared about. He knew for a fact that Glenn's the, you know, mattered to her most. So... I don't understand why it was, oh, I want to sit there and get to see her. I want to, he didn't look for Michonne. He didn't look for Rosita, but he wanted to see her specifically. I didn't know what that was about. And I think that was another power play on Negan's part, just to show that, hey, Rick, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter who I have to use to get to you. I'm going to show that there's not one person here who's going to put themselves on the line for you ever again, because this, because now you have to deal with me. And nobody's safe. So... Where is she? What is she doing? Why are you protecting her? Why are you hiding her? Because if I want to see somebody, bring them out front and center. But he couldn't because she's not there. Yeah, by the way, she was carrying on. He said that uh, she must have been married to number two, which elicits the nose crinkle of doom look from Rick, where his nose kind of gets crinkled up and he shoots him a look and he said, ah, careful how you look at me, Rick. That kind of uh, knocks Rick's anger back down because he knows what's at stake here. He knows that, you know, this could turn bad in, in a really, really awful way quickly. I mean, he's seen it. He's experienced it more than once. So uh, at this point, Negan reveals his dating uh, dating plan where he tried to elicit a date before the funeral's over, apparently, because he wants nothing more than to fill the widow's, uh, the widow's emptiness. Okay, so, you know, and wants to fill the widow's emptiness or her box or her whatever because he doesn't have any emotional attachment. He doesn't want to form an emotional attachment. He just wants to basically take the king's right and have a prima nocta, as it were, and, again, exert his dominance. Just show that I can have what I want when I want, and you'll do nothing to stop me. So... Rick's, you know, he wants to know where uh, he wants to know where she is. Rick really doesn't have an answer for her and he doesn't want to get caught in the lie. And probably the the most conveniently timed entrance in the whole episode, uh, Father Gabriel kind of comes up behind Negan. And you could tell they didn't he didn't expect a priest to be wandering around at this point. I believe the line was, holy crap, you're creepy as shit sneaking up on me with that collar and that freaky smile. Uh, Father Gabriel kind of uh, asks him if he wants to pay his respects. We cut to an overhead shot, another really, really well done shot of the cemetery where it looks like three newly dug graves are there. I felt, I felt like that was a that was a, a good shot because not, not even a good shot. I, you know, it shows that, you know, they are tactful, even without Rick being there. Because I actually didn't expect Father Gabriel to be there myself. I, I, you know, him coming up now out of old times and coming up in that exact situation, it, I feel like it actually played to Rick's favor because it took all the heat off of him. For a second, that it wasn't Negan focused on him. It wasn't Negan sitting there trying to boast over him. It, you know, even though it was a short period of time, it was a period of time where Negan's entire focus was on somebody else. And that was able to, tri I, I'm not going to say trip him up, but it was able to allow him enough time to reset so Rick could get himself together. Right. But it also 
shows that the people of Alexandria still maintain a sense of humanity. I mean, he he realizes he's standing in a graveyard, and I, I'm not sure the saviors take any time to go and bury their dead and pay respects and do anything like that. So it kind of gives more of a glimpse f- for Negan and the other saviors he's got with him that, you know, all right, these people might not be as savage as we think they are. So it might give some of the saviors some pause. I'm not sure it's really going to because I think they enjoy the power that they're holding with Negan. But it might come into play later. Absolutely. I don't know if you guys noticed, but uh, Gabriel was wiping dirt away from his pants as if these graves were really new. So I know it's a three-day period, but he either didn't change his pants or, you know, uh, they almost got caught there. Um you know, they kind of hold vigil over the graves. Negan uh, explains that this is on all of us, you know, kind of we're all in this together. He says, number one, I had to do, you know, uh, lessons had to be learned. But number two, that was on Daryl. Uh, and then now on top of it, does Daryl also believe that he might have killed Maggie as well? Yeah, I think he does. But I, I think that rather than that being a, a sticking point for him where he delves deeper into the darkness of Daryl's soul, I think that's going to be something that, although he knows he caused that, it's going to be something that allows him to gain strength from it and fight the powers that be even stronger. He's he's going to come out stronger from it. I mean, the the blinking earlier in the episode shows that he may look broken, he may act broken, but he is far from broken. See, and this is where I believe that you might be um, have some misgivings with Rick, because I don't believe Mick, uh, Rick is broken either. I, I just, I think that he sees what he needs to do to survive at this point, and he's willing to adapt and overcome. But I have a feeling that pushed in the right circumstances, you're going to see old Rick shine. I do feel that uh, Daryl is, is a very well-orchestrated character. There's not much that he can't do, like you were saying earlier. But um, he is... he. I feel like everybody is good at playing the possum role. I feel like everybody is well adept to analyzing the situation, realizing what they can lose or what they can gain, and they don't want to sit there and do anything hasty. I do agree with Egg as far as he may think that, you know, he has killed Maggie too. But I feel like Daryl has a resolve that's stronger than a lot of them. And that's why he is, uh, he'll be crucial as we go along in the season. A gunshot's heard, which leads uh, Negan and Rick and the rest of the group over to the infirmary, where we see Carl has realized that half means whatever the fucks the saviors want it to be. And they're taking all of their meds. Carl is far from happy about it. Negan starts trying to talk him down. He says, I like you, kid. I don't want to do anything to hurt you. But we got to have a discussion about your man-sized balls here. Uh, eventually, Carl relents. Uh, I almost wish he would have shot this guy because he turns out to be the most creepy savior there is. Uh, this little emotional outburst leads Negan to tell uh, Rick that, uh, I just remembered, you have an ass load of guns, and we want them. Now, did you guys pick up on the vibe that uh, not Daryl, uh, disarming Rosita and Spencer at the beginning of the episode might have led to them taking all their guns, or did he not want them to set up a roadblock or a, a, a sabotage point down the road, and that's why he disarmed them, Like almost like, I take your guns, you have to come back, or did you kind of get the vibe that this was the point in the trip to begin with? I believe it was the point to begin with. There was no... I don't think for a second that it was... It was... A spur of the moment decision. It uh, not Daryl disarming Rosita and Spencer was once again, as I said, a power move. He, you know, this is what we're gonna do. This is what our group's gonna do. But I feel like that was their entire entire intention when they walked in. That they knew they were going to clean house. They knew where they were gonna sit there, and they were going to stop any form of resistance, even if they thought they had some resistance. They wanted to clear their minds of that at all. Um, I also believe that him taking their guns is a little bit more of a, I guess, a, a creative decision because in the comic book I found out was they he didn't take the guns. 
in the comic book, he said they can keep their guns because you guys are stupid because the guns uh, attract all the walkers to you. He's like, and you do notice that a lot of Negan's people have bats, machetes, and other silent but deadly weapons to take care of business without making too much noise. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, the thing is, is they know that a lot of these guns came from saviors that the people from Alexandria did take out. So they knew they had guns to be able to do that. And then they took all those guns. This was a trip to get their guns back and all the guns they had. Again, a more of a power play, uh, exerting their will and taking all their medicine is showing that, you know, if you guys get sick, tough shit, maybe you'll ask us for something. Maybe you'll come to us for something. Maybe, maybe we'll let you save somebody. But you're going to have to ask us. You're going to have to bend knee and we'll decide whether or not you get the things that you need because we're going to take whatever we want to take whenever we want to take it. And this is a big power play. And and it's it's more of a test, I think, to see what kind of reactions they're going to get from the people there. They're, they want to see, are, are we going to be able to do this? Are they going to fight us? What else is going to happen? Hey, and now it's time for a little bit of what's up. This is where we talk about what we think is up, what we think is cool, what we think is grand, what we think is awesome this week. Well, Ig, my what's up for this week is 11 minutes and 37 seconds of the most powerful social commentary I've ever heard in a long time. I'm talking about Dave Chappelle's monologue on SNL. It's both hilarious and a direct punch to the gut. Always being more of a fan of the Chappelle show rather than his stand-up, Dave's efforts are as on point that night as anything I've ever heard from Pryor or Carlin growing up. Is a direct reflection of the fear and uncertainty of a large portion of the world going forward. You can find it on SNL.com and on YouTube. Dave Chappelle's monologue on SNL. That's what's up. Hey, what's up for me this week is the new movie Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Set in the universe of Harry Potter, but 70 years before Harry Potter read any books at Hogwarts, this movie features the adventures of Newt Scamander in New York, here in the good old U.S. of A., in the secret community of witches and wizards 70 years before anything happened that we already know about. It's a new look into the wizarding world, I think you're really going to enjoy it. It's a good time. Go check it out. Fantastic beasts and where to find them in theaters now. That's what's up. So we cut over to the armory in uh, Rick's group's ass load of guns, and the saviors are currently ra uh, ransacking it. Right away, uh, Negan uh, establishes Olivia's responsibility for not only the food, but the guns. So you can tell that's going nowhere good. Uh one of the uh, biggest Neganisms of the, uh, the the show occurs when he everybody walks away and he grabs Rick and he says, I am the only one that, uh, do, am I the only one that realizes you're leaving a fat lady in charge of the food? <laughs> that was pretty good. Pretty good shot. You know, you're going to leave a fat lady in charge of the food and she doesn't seem to be losing a lot of weight very quickly. So what are you doing, man? What are you doing? I think that was... Maybe even a reference to our show. I think that was Negan's, really? <laughs> really, Rick? Really, you're leaving a fat lady in charge of the food? That was kind of messed up. That was, you know, why would you why would you pick on, on her like that? But, I mean, it is Negan. It's, you know, it's his cynical nature. Yeah, nothing seems to be taboo with that guy. A um, little back and forth between Rick and Negan, uh, making sure, and once again, setting the stage, are all the guns here, Rick? You know, are, are you not uh, hiding some, waiting for some to pop out? Rick says, to the best of his knowledge, all the guns are there. We know that what that's setting up. And then uh, we cut to the woods where uh, Master of the Obvious Spencer and Rosita are, are, are now actively out looking for Daryl's bike. Spencer, quick, as always, states that, oh, it's still here. Well, Spencer, it is the apocalypse. It's been three days. It was in the bushes. Where exactly was it going to go? I don't think the zombies are teaching each other motorcycle lessons at this point. Not yet. Although in uh, episode two and three, they did pick up a rock and scale offense. So maybe much like life, there's some more high functioning zombies than others. Well, and high functioning just like you? Um, probably not as high functioning as me, but probably close. Nearly. So 
Well, once again, as everything for effect, uh, we cut back to Negan and Rick, and he wants to see if uh, they've been taking care of his guns. So he points it at Daryl to try to rattle Rick. He points it at Rick and then takes out his aggression on some poor random window that had nothing to do with the episode. Well, it ain't his window. I mean, it's not like he's going to have to have bugs coming in at night, biting him on the ass while he's trying to sleep. He's not going to get rain dropping on his head because the window's broken out. He's good to go. Well, I don't know if you guys have seen a Georgia Skeeter, but they're nothing to laugh at. They will take and uh, carry away a small child. So uh, Negan unleashes my absolute favorite line of the show as one of his henchmen carry up a rocket launcher. And he says, wow, you guys took out Little Timmy and the Dick Brigade. What a fantastic name for a roving band of thugs. Little Timmy and the Dick Brigade. Getting your last licks in, Rick. Little Timmy and the Dick Brigade. Uh, that, that that sounds right, you know? I mean, it sounds like us, you know? Little Cynic in the Moron Brigade, but we're doing okay. I think you had it right at Dick. So we get introduced to a, 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 another named henchman for the Saviors, a really badass-looking chick named Arat. Uh, something tells me that either Rosita's knife or Michonne's, uh, Michonne's sword is going to find and be the end of Arat. But uh, she yanks Olivia up and informs Negan that there are actually two guns missing. And panic ensues. Rick calls a town meeting. Uh, he uh, tries to persuade everybody that they should give the guns back, you know. Uh, and then Eugene aptly looks around and says, well, you know, there are people that aren't here. And there are three that are missing. So at that point, out of the three people missing, Michonne, Spencer, and Rosita, who did you guys think had the guns? To be honest with you, from the beginning of the episode, I honestly thought it was going to be Michonne. Not saying that she was hiding secrets, but she is the one who had the big gun in the beginning. So, of course, you know, context clue would lead you to believe that'd be her. Well, I thought I thought Spencer and I thought Spencer because he's never trusted Rick. He's never trusted what's going on. He, he always thinks that someone can do better, especially him. So... It's like he doesn't want to be a part of the team. He doesn't want to play along. So I thought Spencer. Uh, I didn't think Rosita just because she had a gun and she was happy with the gun she had. But Spencer seems like the kind of guy that would, you know, screw you over and hide some things from everybody if he could get the chance. Yeah, we cut to the woods and Rosita uh, is going hand to hand on some walkers. Some, you know, the first real action that we've actually seen out of her in the, probably the whole run of the series. So that kind of made me happy. I, I, I deemed this scene Rosita Croft. And she also, in my opinion, performs zombie kill of the week by uh, tossing and kind of tripping the, the walker and slamming him down on the, the broken shard of uh, the, the tree trunk. Absolutely great. Absolutely brutal. And I love that shot. It was such a good kill. It, it shows that she has the same viciousness that everybody else has. And I feel like it was actually kind of needed because as much as she gets at Eugene for not participating as much as everybody else, it's about time she showed her skill. So they toss Rosita's place and then they toss Spencer's. Uh, you can tell Rick's going hard at Spencer's because he believes he has the gun. And eventually they actually find not only the gun, but a couple cans of food and some wine. Uh, not making, you know, not Spencer's best day for uh, in a long shot. You can tell that Rick is both extremely disappointed and relieved at the same time because if they don't find those guns uh, Negan's absolutely going to kill Olivia in front of everybody and that's the one thing that he's trying to avoid in this whole trip so we cut to the street and uh, creepy savior of the week goes to green balloon guy for kind of rifling Eden and making her beg for her balloons his overuse of the uh, the term little girl in that exchange was probably one of the most disturbing things in the episode in my opinion well I feel like they're doing exactly what they're meant to do. They're creeps. You know, now it's kind of worrisome to how, how creepy they're going to be, but he played the role. He played the role of my team's stronger than yours. You'll do what I say. And that's pretty much what they, pretty much what they did. But what is concerning is regardless if it's the end of the world or not, there is something that bothers people about kid touchers. And that was real weird with that whole caressing the cheek of this 15, 16 year old girl. So 
I don't know. It just was an odd scene, but I feel like they played it to their strengths. I agree. Uh, here's the thing, though. I think some of these characters they're creating... I like to say parallels to Game of Thrones. Uh, and what Game of Thrones has done so well is they've created some bad guys that you can't help but like and some bad guys that you can't wait for someone to, to hand it to them. And Negan is kind of like Jamie Lannister as far as I'm concerned. And this green balloon guy is totally Joffrey and it, as he was acting there I mean you, you can't you can't wait for someone to just poke him in the eye all the way through the back of his skull you can't wait because that guy is so creepy so bad Negan is a bad guy but he's a fun bad guy so you're gonna you're gonna hate him a little bit but you're gonna kind of love to hate him where the other ones you just hated, and there have been some other characters in the past, and at some point they've all gotten their comeuppance, and I think that's where it's heading. I mean, and and it worked in other shows, and it's going to work here. So I I think that it, even in falling in Walking Dead's past, I mean, I it, it kind of repeats itself in history as a way of doing that. The green balloons definitely being uh, a callback and probably the only thing that Edith has left to remember Glenn by. Not sure why she was carrying him on her person, but I, I understand the sentimentality of the, the balloons themselves and why she didn't want to give them up. So we cut to the fence, uh, are we, uh, the fence line anyway. The, this, the, the saviors are getting ready to leave. We see that they've taken furniture. We've seen that they've taken mattresses and Rick's ass load of guns are all loaded up. Uh, you can tell that the Rick is a little bit on edge still because they're just not leaving. Um, Rick spots Michonne in a burnt out building holding what looks to be the gun that she took with him. And right away, you can tell that he's afraid that, well, if I saw her, who else saw her too? So he asks and then he begs Negan for a, a second, which you could just tell, no overwhelms him with joy that Rick would beg him for anything. You know, please, can I have a second? He goes to the uh, the building and there's a discussion with Michonne and uh, he, he wants her gun. Uh, she's apprehensive about giving it up, but she finally does. Do you think at this point Michonne still trusts Rick's leadership? I think she does, but I think she's got some questions. And I think you know, like like you said before, she may not have been there when the breakdown happened before when when Lori died or his wife died. I don't think it was Lori. Sorry. Uh, that being said, you know, she she still just needs to get Rick back. She trusts him, but she's going to question some things and wait till Rick shows some strength again to, to let him run whatever way he wants to run. I feel like it goes back to the proof is in the pudding due to the fact that they've gotten so far with following him, it's kind of hard not to think that, you know, all right, from his track record, obviously it's, you know, obviously there may be some way of us being able to get out of this, but they've never taken a loss as hard as they have with Glenn and with Abraham. So I, you know, as Cynic said, she's apprehensive. She's not sure if, uh, she's not sure if She's ready to take another loss like that. She's not sure if she can trust his decisions anymore. It's just, it's it's a gray area because it's, you know, there always, there's always going to be that what if. So Rick brings back the gun once Michonne gives it up and hands it to Negan and tells him, listen, this wasn't on the list. We only used it for hunting. It never came inside. Uh, this pleases Negan because he sees it as another sign of uh, Rick giving into his will. Um they also, unfortunately, take Michonne's uh, deer, another, you know, another couple of Neganisms. He said, well, Rick, this is reading the room and getting the message. And I've said it before, you are special. And of course, he unloads on the, uh, you know, I love when a girl buys me dinner and then doesn't expect me to put out afterwards. So we come to the close of the, uh, we come to the close of the Savior's visit. Rick says, hey, listen, we get the rules. We're in compliance. Can Daryl stay? Uh, Negan responds with, well, no. And then he said, well, let Daryl plead his case, knowing that Daryl probably isn't going to do that. But this also led to the fan theory that uh, the saviors have possibly cut out 
uh, cut out Daryl's tongue. Did uh, either of you guys pick up on that? I didn't. I didn't think that they cut out his tongue. I just think that Daryl knows if he starts speaking, trying to plead his case or something else, it's going to go much worse in the long run or even the short run. I I think he, he knows that he needs to be where he's at to be able to affect the change that he thinks needs to happen. So he's doing it from the inside. You know, it's it's hard to do it when you can't be there. So he's going to be there and do the things that need to be done to change their futures. I don't believe his tongue is cut out either. I think that what it is, is much like Rick, he doesn't want anybody else to die. He doesn't want to sit there and go against Negan in any way, shape or form. Cause who knows, who knows if Negan had a talk with him beforehand. I don't know if, you know, there was anything said beforehand, but I'm pretty sure that Daryl's aware of the situation. He doesn't want to sit there and allow anything to put in jeopardy anybody at Alexandria. So he's just going to play as the help, just like Negan said in the beginning. That's all he is is the help. I'm not going to sit here and try to be a comrade. I'm not going to sit here and try to be a bargaining ship. I'm here just as what I am for the safety of everybody else. Yeah, on a funny side note, I, I don't know if you guys have seen the easy, uh, easy street pop figure for Daryl, but it's hilarious. Um, I, I'm, I rarely buy them, but I very well might end up picking that one up. So uh, Daryl brings back uh, Rosita brings back D- Daryl's uh, motorcycle and gives it to not Daryl. Uh, Negan asks Rick, do you want me to go? And Rick responds with that would be good. And he said, well, Rick, all you have to say is those magic two little words. Apprehensively, Rick looks at him and thanks him. Uh, Negan responds with no, thank you. As he walks over and he kills yet another walker. Obviously a callback to the the beginning of the episode. I don't know where they're finding just these one single walkers for Negan to kill. But, you know, it it's all in the message. So before uh, Negan leaves, he wants Rick to know. In case you missed it, Rick, I just slid my dick down your throat and you thanked me for it. Without a doubt, the probably top five most powerful lines in the season. And he really just drove the point across. Absolutely. It might be one of the top five most powerful quotes in, in the entire series run. It, it was It was strong and it got to the point and it hammered it home. And there's no other way to say that that's absolutely true because he did thank him after letting him just absolutely rape him and their whole community. I thought that the line was the most cringeworthy ever because, of course, of how Negan said it. He's like, I just fed you my dick and you thanked me for it. And that sick, sadistic, Joker-like smile to know that I've taken everything that you possibly could have had is just the most just anxiety-inducing feeling that I've ever felt in one of these episodes. So we cut to the trucks pulling out. Of course, they'll, you know, for... Sentimental, the reasons the last thing we see is Daryl sitting in the back of the truck. Rick looks up and sees their very outdated motto for the town up on the wall. And it says, uh, mercy for the loss and vengeance for the plunders. So we get a nice meet and greet by the gate between Spencer and uh, Rick. And you can know uh, you know that this is only going to go in the worst possible place. Rick informs him of, uh, Spencer of the mess that he's made and lets him know that, you know, we had to ransack your house. You had guns. Uh, uh, we had to save Olivia. Spencer seems a little more preoccupied with the fact that, uh, you know, people went through his house. My guess would be that he didn't want anybody to see the, the Rick dartboard or I hate Rick Grimes graffiti all over his walls. But, you know, it's also out that he might have been hiding some food and some liquor. And a voodoo doll. <laughs> Yeah, very well. Yeah, very well. Might be a voodoo doll as well. I, I was going to say that. Uh, I, I mean, the whole thing as far as Rick getting mad at Spencer. I feel like he was more upset because Spencer was gone during the time that they needed the guns because he said it himself. He's like, I've scurried guns away. We've all scurried things away. It's what we do when we're not sure how things are going to go. But 
I think he was more upset at the fact that it became that close to someone else losing their life and the community that that's why Rick was so adamant about putting Spencer in his place. Well, time and time again, Spencer has showed that he's out for Spencer and Rick lets him know. He's like, you know, I get the guns. I've done it. He said, but as far as the food and the wine, you did this because you were small. You were lucky that we're, uh, you were lucky to have these walls and you were lucky when you got us. Um, Spencer replies with, we should have made a deal when we had a chance, but you're, you're, uh, you're right, Rick. We're lucky. You led us to the promised land. Do you think Glenn and Abraham were lucky too? With that, you know, mouth dropped open. I was, I was just waiting for the, the beating to start. I don't know about you guys. Oh, I thought the beating was coming. I really thought it was coming. And I was like, here it comes. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yeah, I thought Rick was just going to go straight ham on Spencer. I didn't think there was going to be a second. There wasn't going to be any type of second thought about it at all. But I feel like Rick is true to his work. He really doesn't want anybody else dying. And he doing anything to Spencer would just make him more of a liability, if not an ally to Negan. So I feel like he chose the better of the two evils. And the better of the two evils he chose was to basically tell him, you know, next time you say something like that to me again, you're going to be picking up all your teeth with broken fingers. Exactly. I'll break your jaw and I'll knock your teeth out. Do you understand? Say yes. And an hour and 20 minutes into the hour and 30 minute episode, we finally see Rick pick his head out. And this uh, is why I disagreed with you before is I don't think Rick is gone. I think he's hiding. And I think he's doing a very good job of convincing Deegan that, all right, I'm on board. But he's most definitely waiting. So we, uh, you know, we cut to the sleeping arrangements. Now it seems like everybody on Alexandria are now sleeping on the floor, which is just fantastic. Uh, Michonne's kind of eyeing Rick. Um, She finally questions him and says, you know, everything we've ever gained is through fighting, uh, you know. And he goes into the story that, that a lot of people you know, I've, I've kind of questioned this going through the show because they do a real bad job of representing the timeline. Uh, he explains to her that his partner, Shane, and his wife, Lori, had an affair, and uh, he knows baby Judith isn't his. However, he'll do anything he can to keep her alive because to him, that's the whole reason they're doing this is to keep humanity moving forward. What did you guys feel about that scene? I feel that it played up to Rick's uh, Rick's credit as, you know, everybody wants to pretend or, you know, lack thereof of being the, you know, the, the leader, the savior, the good guy, the guy who wants the best for the, the community. But I think in all honesty, that's what Rick really wants. I mean, you know, you're not going to get the perfect lifestyle, especially not in the apocalyptic era that they're in. But I do feel like he's going to try to, make the best out of the uh, out of their bad situation and i feel like that even though things haven't gone exactly as planned and even though his life isn't what he expected it to be he's going to try to get his piece of happiness wherever he can find it and you know me being a step parent myself my stepdaughter is my daughter i raised her I brought her around. I know she's not mine biologically, but she is mine. And I think maybe there's a little bit of that going on with Rick, too. You know, that's still his wife's kid. So it's his kid. And where's Shane anyway? Shane ain't here. So that kid needs a parent. And mom's gone. Somebody needs to step up. I don't think that Carl is ready. So it better be Rick. Yeah, absolutely. Um, There's a nice back and forth between Michonne and Rick. And uh, he basically says, I can't lose anybody else. And she says, you know, it's not your fault when people die. And Rick responds with, not always, but sometimes it is. Uh, The next day, uh, they cut to her back on the truck, uh, obviously gunless, um, trying to decompress a little bit, uh, walking around. And then she either sees something or smells something, which leads her to the road. And there lies a warehouse full of mattresses taken from Alexandria smoldering as the saviors drove them a mile or two down the road and set them on fire. And you could see the absolute anger in her eyes. Yeah. And she was pissed. They took the stuff just to take it out and burn it. So they couldn't have it. And I think that's going to be something that sticks out and she's going to let the people of Alexandria know 
They took the stuff just to light it on fire. They took it just so you couldn't have it. They didn't want it. They didn't need it. They just took it. So do we want to keep putting up with this bullshit or do we want to start plotting on figuring out a way to get back at these some bitches? And I think that's going to be the beginning of the end for the saviors. I think it's it's not going to happen real soon, but it's going to happen. I do feel like Michonne is going to let the others know, but I don't think she's going to make it too public at first because I'm pretty sure everybody knew what they were doing. You could see it in the council hall meeting that they were going to sit there and they were going to, you know, they knew what was going on. Rick told him, I'm not in charge anymore. Negan is. And like he's been, like he did in the entire episode, this is power play moves. This is, I'm doing this because I can, and I'm going to do whatever I want because I can. And if you can stop me, try it. And that's what that mattress move was. You don't, we don't need them. It didn't change anything. It's not going to do anything for us. It's just because we can. Yeah, on Rosita's outing, she found a gun and uh, she found a shell casing. And the, the episode ends with her knocking on Yoon Jin's door and asking him to build her a bullet. Now, I hope she uses that bullet and doesn't give it to Michonne. If not, then he's going to need probably 15 to 20 more. And she still may not hit the target she's looking for. <laughs> Yeah, most unfortunate. Um, to close the episode, uh, I had uh, people had problems with the cell, which was the third episode, which we didn't cover yet. Uh, they thought it was too knee and heavy. I, I, I tended to agree. I thought some of the writing was a little less than stellar with it. So what do you do when you have a Negan heavy episode? You follow it with another one. They really should have split these two episodes up. I don't know if it necessarily needed to be the hour and a half long that it was. I mean, they had a lot of ground to cover, but there was a lot of filler that they probably could have chopped from the episode. Um, I just want to take a minute because there people are really uh, lamb blasting the Negan character. And I don't think that they're looking at the complete picture of this guy. I mean, the governor was a charismatic threat and he kept his violence secret. Negan wears his violence on his shoulder. And it's not, um, I, I no, Jeffrey Dean Morgan is a little small for the role physically. Uh, Negan is much more of a linebacker type in the, so he's much more of a physical threat in the comic book. So some of that is a lost in translation a bit, but I, I, I call back to Jurassic Park when they're talking about the Raptors and how they're constantly probing and looking for weakness and looking to strike. If you watch Jeffrey Dean Morgan's portrayal of Negan, every single second he's talking to you, he's measuring you. And a lot of the thing, just about everything he says is for effect. Now he's the alpha male without a doubt. But he's also highly intelligent. He's also, this just makes him completely dangerous because not only will he outthink you, but he carries a bat on his shoulder and he'll just beat you to death. And I, I think he, that's made him cocky. And I think that he, he's misstepping with Dwight. He, he's, he wants, he wants. He's that guy that sat at the lunch table at school, and it wasn't enough that he was the quarterback of the team, but he also had to beat on or tease the the, the smallest and the weakest uh, people. And those type of people, deep down, they're they're weak in the inside, but it doesn't make this guy, uh, because he says can't be things or because he has this, uh, because I'm here, it's a party and it's the greatest place to be uh, type demeanor, it doesn't make this guy any less dangerous. I, I think people are really misjudging this character. I, I, I think that slightly overused. They uh, they cast Stephen Ogg as his right hand man, uh, and the guy's a brilliant actor. And I really I see in the previews that they're going to use him next episode, but I really think they should have used him a little bit more, uh, a little bit more, and maybe the cell, and maybe here too. Uh, we understand that Negan's going to be the center of the show. I mean, it was all over the internet before it started. Uh, I don't think he necessarily needs to be in every single scene. You know, that's just my take on it. I, I agree with that. But here's the thing. They need to get a good base on Negan. They're trying, I think, to make sure that everyone understands where he's coming from, who he is, so that things can slow down with him later. But we already know Negan's out there. 
I think it's necessary, and yeah, it's a little heavy so far, but I mean, I, I remember feeling pretty heavy about the governor when he showed up, too, and I didn't like the governor as much as I liked Negan. I think, as far as a character, Negan's character seems deeper, seems better written, and amazingly acted by Jeffrey Dean Morgan. He may not fit the physical attributes from the comic book, but the mentality and how he portrays Negan and everything seems very good, and it fits this show because not everybody even in the show fits their comic book persona but they they're they've done some great casting and they've picked some good roles i feel like that jeffrey dean morgan is playing the role phenomenally and i feel like that the character of negan himself is just an amazing character he is a psychological villain he in the comic book is more physically intimidating but I mean, even on even on the smaller side, Jeffrey Dean Morgan hasn't slipped up at all to make you feel like, oh, well, you can get away with anything just because of my size. So I feel like you guys both have played to his strengths. He he is the the one of the perfect villains. Well, in Negan's ego, and this is the parallel between Negan and Rick, uh, obviously, because being the two leaders of these factions, Negan's ego allows him to believe that uh, not Dwight is completely on board and he's completely team Negan, even though he's sleeping with his wife, even though he's, he burned him with an iron. Uh, and then you, you have the flip side, somebody who absolutely deserved to be outcast and somebody who doesn't deserve the time of day, father Gabriel, Rick has completely transformed the, their relationship simply through the belief in people that uh, people can be redeemed. And I don't think Negan to see Rick put himself through this to try to save everybody and, and continue on with life, where if you look at someone like Ian, he probably wouldn't skip a meal. You know, they bury their dead. And by the way, uh, we didn't cover this, but I don't believe that there's bodies in those graves at all. But they don't bury their dead. Uh, you know, Rick's group does. You know, life still means something to these people. Uh, Rick is putting himself through every every type of torture to just play along long enough till he can figure out a way out of the situation and the, the amount of humiliation, the way Michonne looked at him when he came up holding Lucille and it was almost as if he forgot he had it in his hand and he said, yeah, she, uh, he made me carry this, you know, the humiliation Negan would never put himself through that to save anybody, let alone a, a town full of people who Rick originally uh, was convinced were weak and not worth saving on a side note too, as well. Uh, I don't believe enough fear is being shown by not only the people of Alexandria, but Rick's group in general. I mean, if somebody f physically bashes your friend's brains in, in front of you, or you have to hear about it secondhand, I think that you would probably be a little more compliant, especially when they show up with uh, a 10 to 1 force at your gate. Uh, you know, the gate's open, they're coming in, there is no fight involved. I just, uh, the defiance... I understand from Carl that he's young, but the defiance of everyone else are not understanding. They, you know, they had to be coaxed out of their house to fight the walkers off. But, you know, they're flippant at a force that's, uh, you know, 10 times their size and, and double the arm that they are. They're like, oh, why are we doing this? Why are we putting up with this? That that part didn't make sense to me. Overall, I uh, I love the episode. Um because of the length and because of the filler in it, especially the Rosita Spencer stuff, I would probably only give it like a seven five. Uh, for me, that episode was very good. I enjoyed it quite a bit. There have been stronger episodes that I liked more, though. Uh, for me, that episode's going to be about a six nine. <clears throat> I guess I'll be the tiebreaker between the two because I believe the episode would be a good seven one. I feel like that it would. Uh that it had its strong points. It definitely wasn't a bad episode. It was decent, as as uh, as was said. Filler kind of, uh, you know, made the episode lag. But other than that, it was definitely good and contributed to the story. So there you have it from the Cynic Radio Podcast. The episode from The Walking Dead, graded from all of us. Let's call it an average of 7.3. Yeah, without a doubt. I can't wait to see what comes next. Uh, I believe we have a Tara and Heath episode coming up. Some uh, Carl and Edith hijinks on the road. Uh, down the road, I think, uh, without a doubt, uh, Rick ends up in the kingdom. And I, I can't wait to see his reactions to uh, King Ezekiel and Shiva. And uh, overall, the season's, uh, the season's headed in the right direction, in my opinion. 
Agreed. Uh, it's it's an exciting season. It's certainly better than the season they spent on the farm so far. I'm enjoying it. So now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, it's time for really. I'd explain it. Just listen. You'll get it. UFC 205 happened this week, and the notorious Conor McGregor won his second belt, making him the first ever champion in two different weight divisions. His dream was to hold up two belts. The only problem was Dana White didn't have a second belt on hand for him once the fight was over. They had to run backstage and borrow Tyrone Woodley's belt. That would be if the Cubs won the World Series and MLB said, Oh, hold on, Chicago. We got to run to Kansas City and get last year's trophy for you. To you completely dropping the ball and being unprepared, UFC and Dana White? Really? Really, for me, this week goes out to social justice warrior and 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick. Kaepernick decided during the election that he was not going to vote after all of the time bringing attention to himself, protesting the national anthem. When asked why, he quoted, I think it would be hypocritical for me to vote. I said from the beginning I was against oppression. I was against the system of oppression. I'm not going to show support for that system. To me, the oppressor isn't going to let you vote your way out of your oppression. All I can say to that is, come on, man. Voting is your way of expressing a voice into this system. So Colin Kaepernick, really? Once again, I want to thank everybody for the support of the show. All the emails and outreach has been fantastic. You guys have been more than supportive, and we thank you for it. We'll be back next week with another episode. I'm sure it'll have Walking Dead in it because that's the only thing going on right now. You can reach us on all the social media sites, Twitter, at Cynic Radio, Facebook, Cynic Radio. Uh, email us at cynicradio at gmail.com. Send us your letters, your emails, your, your pictures of your grandma naked, anything you want. But until next time, don't get captured. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and at cynicradio.com. Available for download on iTunes. 